This is a Power 98.7 podcast. Now we're talking. Subscribe to Power 98.7 podcasts in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. There's more on power987.co.za. I mentioned this a little bit um, when I first started, when I started the show this afternoon and saying, you know, sometimes we need to be able to call a spade a spade before we can fix issues in this country. And sometimes fixing issues in this country goes into the awareness, right? the awareness part of it. You see, I don't understand, and, and I've never been able to understand it for a long time, why is it that black people, it's so easy for us to get access to car finance than it is to get access to a bond or a home loan? Why is it so easy for us to get access to credit cards but it's very difficult for us to get access to business investment or capital investments from financial institutions. I don't understand why is it that so many of us are proud to be known as the black middle class. Because if you have to really decipher the black middle class, I would say that they're the ones that are feeling the pinch right now. Where you live paycheck to paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. You know, financial managers will tell you all the time that you need about six months worth of a salary in order for you to be okay. But how many of us can actually say that we've got six months worth of a salary? And what stops us as entrepreneurs, as professionals, as young professionals who are hoping to move the needle when it comes to wealth creation in this country? What stops us from being able to advance from survival to success? From success to to significance. It only takes us looking at the current unemployment statistics to show us how many of us in this country are in survival mode. We're all, we're all in survival mode. And to what extent are we going to be comfortable with the outcomes of that circumstance? And is it not time for us to start asking and demanding more, more for ourselves, more for our generations, more for our children, more for our future? But how do we get that more if we don't even know what's the status quo? So we're dipping into the status quo this afternoon, joining us to shed light on on this issue. We're going to talk about whether or not your race affects your interest rates when purchasing property, whether or not your race affects your interest rates when seeking capital investments, And what role does race play in your profiling of whether or not you're a good or bad enough person to get access to finance? That's the question. Well, joining us for this now is a financial investigation consultant, Emerald Fanzel, who's been quite vocal about the injustice that is happening amongst our people. Emerald, thank you so much for joining us on Power Lunch this afternoon. A very good afternoon to you. A very good afternoon to you too and to all the listeners. And I would invite you, power listeners, this is where you get to ask all the questions, right? This is your conversation. This is not mine. 0861987000. Emerald is here. Emerald is going to get to the bottom of some of the existing issues that you're facing currently. But before we can even get into the issues, Emerald, maybe you should paint for us a picture of the current status quo which is when it comes to the financial services sector in respect to racial profiling? Well, I've been fighting this battle for 10 years and um, I came actually involved um, in um, <clears throat> when database of FNB was leaked to me and I gave the database to a Monroe Consulting to investigate if black people were paying more than white people on their mortgage bonds. Mm. And the outcome of this was that it was indeed so. Now, if you picture discrimination, there is two ways on mortgage bonds that banks can discriminate. The first one is that they will charge a higher interest rate when you initially signed the bond. And they sort of say this is risk. It's always the word risk comes in. Mm. Now, I'm going to, to, to discuss that a little bit later, but I want to come back and I had a chat with the EFF last Friday, um, and I'll explain that to, to them as well. In 1990, if we go back in 1990, that is when banks wanted to invest in low-cost housing or black housing. Mm. 
And um, they said to the government that they're going to charge a higher interest rate for black people. And the government was not, it was not acceptable for the government at that point in time Mm. because it would lead to discrimination. They appointed a commission to investigate this and and the founding of the commission was that it could lead to a massive stop payment action by black people if this do happen. What happened in 1990 the bank then, the, the government then went to the banks and said, no, that is not on. Everybody must be charged the same interest rate on mortgage bond. And what they will do is they will amend the Usury Act that was applicable on money lending transactions at that point in time and allow banks to charge a five rand that excluded fee on all mortgage bonds in South Africa. That is now on white bonds, black bonds, or, or all the bonds. Mm, mm. And that was, the, the Usury Act was amended, um, and um, it was um, laid before Parliament, and, uh, and uh, that was in approximately June 1990, and the banks were allowed to charge a five rand fee on all bonds. And that fee was there to cover any losses due to the so risk factor. Got you. So from 1990, there was a fee available or paid to to banks to charge black people and white people the same interest rate. Now, to charge a black people, say, 3 4% more than a, a white people, and I've got plenty of evidence to prove this, it is absolutely crazy because the so much so called risk factor that they that they are talking about from nineteen ninety four most of the people that got bonds were government employees. They got a subsidy from the government mm. for their house. Their monthly installments went off straight from their salary. Now Nobody can tell me where is the so-called risk that they always come back to, you know? And that is one way of discriminating. The other one that I found out, and that was more related to First National Bank, is that when the interest rate comes down in a decreasing phase, and I'm referring now to 19... to 1998, 99, when the interest rate was up to 25%, mm. and there was a big decrease in interest rate. And they, at some decreases, they did not decrease the interest rate of low cost housing. And I've got evidence, internal documentational evidence, that says, for example, the interest rates on all mortgage bonds are coming down excluded from this decrease is low-cost housing. Why? That is, well, the only thing that can be that is profit-related. There's nothing else that it's profit-related. I've got people here. I've got a Mr. Simon Michaels, which I, I'm referring now to the Salambos Legal Clinic. He signed a bond in 1996 with uh, Sambo, but at that stage, Sambo was taken over by FNB. After 21 years, his, his, the amount that he applied for was, if my memory serves me correctly, was 65,000 rand. At present, he is, owes the bank, after 21 years, 20, no, 71,000 rand. The overcharge on his mortgage loan was 230,000 rand due to the fact that FNB did not decrease his interest rate at decreases of the of of the um of the repo rate or the bank um prime rate and this is this is is what's happening and people and mr michaels at the present moment is paying about 50 percent more on his monthly installments due to discrimination and i've got evidence of 32,000 clients on low-cost housing which data leaked from FNB to me. So I can 
I can say that is so. I cannot say that it's definitely with APSA Bank and with Standard Bank, although I see it because I haven't got that database to say, to make a, a, a statement like that. But if we have to look at the general banking sector, uh, Emerald, and not specifically paying to mind to FMB, as you're saying, but just a general banking sector, has it been racially profiling people for, for I mean, as you say, 1990, the decision was made um, that we, you know, all interest rates are, are the same. But yeah. after that, 1994, we're finding that across the board, the financial yeah. services sector have had, have had it in for black people. Of course, I'm going to I'm going to show you an uh, excellent, and I'm going to this change to motor vehicle finance. Yeah, I was phoned by a manager of West Bank that informed me that West Bank is discriminating against black people. I then went on social media and I requested people, black people with vehicle finance with West Bank, to send me their contracts. I was shocked to see that some of them are paying up to 19%. Prime rate at that stage was 10, about 10%. 19% where black, where white people, the maximum I could see was prime plus two. That is uh, 12%. And I, I was then interviewed on various radio stations. West Bank was invited. And by the way, West Bank is part of First National Bank. West Bank was, was invited to take part in the discussion. They refused. Then they put on social media that how interest rates get, get uh, determined is, first of all, it's, it's, it's credit worthiness. Now, let's talk about credit worthiness. If you got a slight dent on your credit record, you will not get a motor vehicle finance. You can forget about that. So all people that got presently got motor vehicle finance is credit worthy. That's point number one. The other point they they said is affordability. Now let's discuss affordability. The law is clear that when you buy a motor vehicle, your monthly installments cannot be more than 30% of your salary. So everybody that's got a motor vehicle finance account or loan account, can afford it. Otherwise, they wouldn't have got it. Now, why is it that some people pay 19% and others pay 12% and it happens to be that the people that pay 19% is black people? It's as simple as that. Yeah. (laughs) As you're speaking, I'm going, we we have so much to to look at and we've got so much to amend in this country and yeah. we have so much to so much of the injustice to to correct yeah. and i think that the biggest price that black people are paying still yeah. is for just being black you know and and that is a problem if you're going to be paying the price for just being black that needs something to there's something Absolutely. That needs to be said. and you know what 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 really is very concerning for me is we all want to live a nice life mm-hmm. living in a nice home drive a nice motor car, send your kids to good schools. And, you know, that is part of life. But we're not going to achieve that if this situation is still continuing. And I've been fighting 10 years for this. And the hell I had with the government trying to stop me, that is even worse. All right, so before we're going to get into the the response from the government towards, you know, the just what you've uncovered here, let's talk a little yeah. bit about the the aspect of, of, of risk. I mean, you were speaking about how this word risks keeps getting mentioned time and time and time again. Yeah. Are black people perceived to be more risky? And is it based on what as, uh, as well, Emerald? What, what is the risk aspect of it based on? I would I, I I will say that white people are more at risk at the moment because more black people are government employed, but the fact of the risk the risk is always been as excuse if somebody gets charged a higher interest rate. It's always been like that, and we must get away from risk. If you if you got a home loan, your house is up for surety. And they're not going to give you a 100% loan. So 
their, their sort of money is, is secured by your house. Hmm. And 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 uh, that is so. If you if you don't pay, they can sell your house in sale and execution. Their house, your house, is surety. And most of the people, as I said previously, are government employed. They get subsidy on their houses. Why? Where is the risk? Nobody can tell me a risk. Are now, these policies that that govern financial services sectors, uh, Emerald? still apartheid-based policies. I'm saying this in light of a lot of our government policies seem to not have been amended. And a lot of them are still taking the positions of apartheid era. So there's a lot of laziness in being able to amend certain regulations or even maybe, you know, selective amnesia in trying to amend certain regulations to favor the majority. Are some of these policies that we're dealing with policies that existed prior to 1994? I would say definitely so. Absolutely, definitely so. And 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 it, it, it you know it's really it's really scary to see what happens. I mean, people can't afford this high risk. I mean, how many times I get people phoning me on their motor vehicles? They're going to return their motor vehicles because they can't afford it anymore. You know, and they're sitting with their mortgage loan that's in arrears. Now, I'm going to discuss another point here. I have now discovered, and it's on social media, and uh, and I must say at this moment in time, I must just mention this, that I, in my career of 30 years, I have assisted 1,598 people, and mostly of them are black, in stopping the sale in execution of their home. And what happens here is as soon as they default, they put the interest rate up. Two percent or one percent. Now, you ask them why do you do that? They said no, the client's risk is higher. Now we charge him more. But what they are doing by putting up the interest rate with one or two percent, they increasing the risk. The client can't pay it at the lower r- uh, rate. Now they're putting the interest rate up, and to put the interest rate up is totally illegal. It's against the law. You cannot do that. And on that basis, I'm stopping sales in execution. And I've done an APSA loan just recently for, for a person. And they up his interest rate because he was allegedly, or he was in a, allegedly in arrears. He wasn't in arrears. The overcharge on his account was 504,000 rand. Mm. I mean, good heavens. I mean, Standard Bank is exactly the same. Uh, I caught them out, and uh, and uh, um, they refunded four clients or three clients, and then in the amount of eighty six and eighty seven, eighty three, forty seven, forty two thousand rand, where they up the interest rates, and I and I confronted them that they said it's illegal. They refunded that. But what about the the bulk of the clients that is still overcharged? Um, they went to the citizen. The citizen contacted them, the newspaper, and they said, "Oh, they did the accident. They did a big mistake because the interest. Rate, their contact says they can up the interest rate when you're in arrears, you default. But in this case, they did not correct it. They made a mistake, and now they're correcting it. Now I'm sitting here with two cases that I referred to them re- recently. The one is." 350,000 rand. The other one is 240,000 rand. And I asked him, why don't you rectify this account? So don't even answer my email. And so there's a yeah. massive, yeah, massive overcharge on, 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 on exceed, uh, or contravening the Usury Act and the National Credit Act. And who must govern this? The National Credit Regulator. The nothing, no, National Credit Regulator is doing nothing in this regard. And he knows about it because I've referred complaints to him. Got you. Emerald, we're going to continue with this conversation. Then we're going to bring in the Black Business Council. They've been lamenting how black people need uh, and black business owners need capital investments, right? That the time needs to be now where you start investing in black businesses if black businesses are truly to thrive. But if racial profiling is happening, even in the financial services um, uh, sector, then what hope does the black person have? And more importantly, the question that I would pose to you, Power Family, now that we're hearing these allegations that are coming up, what do we do about it? How do 
we amend it? And how do we solve the issue? Because the truth of the matter is, if we're going to phone and complain, go, yeah, it's government, it's government. Okay, until when? Because by the way, even government employees are also bearing the brunt of it. 0861987000. We are getting into the thick of things. James and Santon, hi. Hi, James. Hey, how are you? I'm very well. Thanks to you, Papa. Go ahead. Yeah, my energy is gone, eh? From just hearing the men yeah, saying what it's saying. Emerald is sobering us up this, uh, this it's, Thursday. It's really... I just want to say, I, I, I've been chasing banks when it comes to property finance, and I've done a few. None of the finances that I've got now, I got them without fighting the bank. Mm. And it, took, it has taken me over a period of eight years now to learn how the bank works. And none of those finances happened first time. I have to fight and fight and put race inside there until the bank then approves. And one question I just want to pose, and probably we need to ask, why is South African government allowing the South African banks to give us these residual payments? Why is the financing of a vehicle made so easy and it gets easier and easier by the day and nothing is being done towards purchasing of a property there's more assistance in purchasing a vehicle right now there's more models that the car dealerships are using in the banks to make it easier for us to afford these expensive cars yet i'm not seeing any innovation towards financing properties I get you, and James. lastly from me, Faith, as black people, there's one thing we can do. Let's stop paying. Let's stop buying these expensive cars. And let's move our monies to the right banks. Mm. And we need to speak with our purchasing power that we've got as black people. Without us, white companies don't exist. And the day we realize that, the day we're going to realize our power. Got you. I got you 100%. We're going to continue this. What do we do, people? What do we do? Now that we know there's this kind of discrimination, Mr. K saying, Hi, Faith, I once had this conversation with one of the employees at the bank I was with. I asked, Why give me a car worth 500,000 Rand, but you guys refused to give me a home loan worth the same value? I never got a straightforward answer. I am still renting even now. How? How? And maybe that's what we need to start doing. Is that what black people need to start doing? Stop with the expensive cars and get uh, uh, into the, the realm of property so we demand the expensive property? We're going to unpack this. We're going to unpack this more with Emerald as well as Khanki Mataban is going to join us from the Black Business Council after this. Time now, though, is one thirty. Let's catch up with your latest in Power News. Call Faith on 0861-987-000. It is 25 minutes to go before the top of the hour. We're still in conversation with Emerald Van Zale, who is a financial investigation consultant. We're also going to be joined in a short moment by Khanki Mataban, a Black Business Council CEO. And this is regarding why we get access to finance for certain things and why we don't get access to finance for other things. So, for example, I, don't, I still don't understand to this day, why is it easier getting a car as a black person than it is getting a, getting a home loan? That thing does not make sense to me. You know, why is it that it's easier to get a car financing than it is easier to get, um, uh, uh, what is it called, uh, uh, capital investment into your business? And then it made me wonder about this, and I'm hoping that you can shed light on this on Power Family 0861987. Could it possibly be, could it possibly be that there is an unspoken narrative that if we keep the black person in a position where they get to go to the fancy restaurant every Friday, they have access to the flashy car, they get to rent out an apartment in, let's say, for lack of a better, Midrand. As long as we give them a, a townhouse in Midrand, as long as they can drive a flashy car, as long as every weekend they can go to the nearest uh, a, a club or can be seen, as long as we give them just enough cash to get by to the 23rd of every month. Just enough. Not too much. Just enough cash to get by to the 23rd of every month. Then we keep the black person at a level where they don't have to be a threat to us. Keep them poor. Keep them flashy. So that you can keep them less significant. Is that what we're facing? And are we falling into that? Zero eight six one nine eight seven triple zero. Tabo and Mami Lodi. Hi, Tabo. Faith, yes, it's Bob. exactly what you just said. You know, they want to keep us being poor so, so that we can always come in crawling to, to, to them. 
say, I can tell you this, I don't blame private sector. They're in there for their money. I blame government. These people had a proposal in the 1990s to show that they're only there for profit making. But the government is conflicted say, because of you cannot be paying this much money, you know, and the government is, 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 is quiet. I can give you a simple example. I built RDP houses for government. Yeah. The very same material that I'm using there, building a 48 square house, is the very same material that Cosmopolitan is building in black, black people's houses. See, government is paying me 120000 but Cosmopolitan is those houses. But Mm, Tabo, I, 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 you, you, your network is breaking up a little bit. Try to get a clearer signal for us, Papa, and then we can continue with it. Let's go to Twani. Godwell, hi. Yeah, well, yes, Pop. Pop. How are you? Good I'm afternoon. very well, thanks, and you? Good. Um, I think you have said it all with regards to um, these uh, liabilities that we call cars. When black people will understand that cars are liability, and then we'll, they, will, they will be able to manage themselves and control themselves with what they have, because... These people are really um, um, uh, exploiting us with car loans, especially FMB and West Bank. I, I believe they are together. Because I purchased my car when I wanted to join over in 2018. And that car, I didn't have any access to money to buy a car to join over. Yeah. And I went, to, I went to West Bank. They approved me. They gave me, I think, 18 or 24 percent interest rate because I was desperate. I didn't know what to do. I accept, they actually advised me to keep it like I, I should keep it like stand that the um, like you know when you I shouldn't I should keep it to be a steady interest rate, not mm. the one that can change tomorrow. Mm, mm, mm. Now, pandemic come, we took a payment uh, holiday, and the, in the clause because we, our, my business was closed, I could not afford to pay the car loan. Then they told us that. If we take a payment holiday, they will tell us they will increase the price of uh, the monthly payment, which we didn't have a choice because we couldn't pay it. And then the, I, I bought a, a Toyota Corolla 2018. Yeah. And then I was paying 7.8. Oh, God, well, I think it's a network. I swear it must be load shedding that is doing this to our network. Hold on there. Hang in there. We're going to try to get through as many of our calls as possible. I know that the lines are going off the hook. But I have to ask the question. Maybe also us as black people, we are our own worst enemies. Every time, every time you meet somebody, it's what car do you drive? All the time, it's what car. The first thing that we're interested in is the, the car that a person drives. You determine somebody's wealth based on the car that they drive, and we don't even realize that that thing is a liability. It's not an asset. And why do we do that? When was the last time you asked, so what kind of house do you live in? How many stories is your house? Jerry in the hi. My sister, how are you? I'm very well, thanks, Nipap. Go ahead. Yeah, the solution to the problems that I'm going to be ventilating on is that uh, taxi owners are suffering the same blows themselves because uh, the banks, in most cases, they are repositioning their taxes. Even mm. though they have paid plus minus 100,000, they are taking the tax and they don't get nothing. To me, I believe that it's illegal. It's not all contracts that are legal. Some of the contracts are dodgy. And illegal. Now, what should happen? Taxi industry should actually create itself, build themselves petrol stations. Yeah. They must actually cut the deal of the banks when they purchase it, quantums. They must go straight to the Toyota and negotiate with the Toyota that they are going to buy taxis as a bulk so that they provide their taxi owners, those who are buying taxis, they provide them with these taxis, provide them with 50 liters of petrol per month so that no one can come and say you failed to or you, you, you defaulted for two months. Mm, now, as a result, mm. you are taking your taxi. So taxi association, they must, do, they must be able to do that, to buy taxis and sell these taxis to their taxi owners, uh, to their uh, fellow members. Because in most cases, these guys are suffering a big blow. They end up without a taxi, but they've been paying a taxi for a period of uh, uh, two years. So I think it is time we build our own petrol stations, we build our own banks that the taxis will be able to invest in, and they will be able to rescue their taxis, they will be able to rescue their families. They will be able to support, to, to circulate their money amongst themselves. I so hear. I think it is time they think better, man. I thank you. Thank you very much for that, on Jerry. Pumi and Centurion. Hi, Pumi. Hi, Faith. How are you? I'm very well. Thanks to you, Mama. Go ahead. I'm okay. Faith, I agree with you that there might just be an unwritten rule that they keep the black men down. But we've got agency as black people. You don't have to buy into that lifestyle. You don't have to do any of that. I'll tell you for myself. Mm. I'm 35. And around 2015, 
I decided I was done with this life. I sold my BM. I bought a Polo Vivo. Four and a half years later, my Polo Vivo was paid up. My house was paid up. You can't do it. You, you, you are not a victim of the system. Yeah. So, I've been living my life at level five or level four for the past five, six years. Because going out is expensive. You just need to make a decision about the kind of life you want and the kind of legacy you want to live, leave behind when you're gone. And then just work at it. You, you don't have to fall victim to the system. Get That's you. the thing I thought about black people, that you think that the system is against you. And it might just be, but you've got agency. There we go. I like it. Pumi and Centurion, thank you very much for that. Emerald, we've been listening to what the callers are saying, right? And I guess the bigger narrative is, and, and what we're pushing right now is, how do we actually change our narrative? But just as a, as a, as a, as a launch pad for, for it, why is it that black people, it, it would appear, and maybe you can correct this, uh, you know, but it would appear as though black people get easier access to financing a, a motor vehicle, which is a liability, than they do to, find, to financing a, a home loan. Why is that? Imro, can you still hear us? Yeah, no, no. Um, I, don't, I really don't know. This is something that has been worrying me as well. Because a car is not actually an asset. A house is an asset. Mm. And, I, and I can't explain this. It's just been something that I cannot answer. I'm sorry. But it exists. But yes, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it exists. Yeah. So now when it comes to government's response to this, uh, Emerald, yeah. where does the government sit? You're saying that, you know, uh, you, you've reached out to government time and time again about the existing narrative and the realities, especially within the financial services sector. But where yeah. do they, what, what do they say to this? Well, they, they're very quiet. I mean, I, uh, uh, the President Cyril Ramaphosa is quite aware of what's going on. He, he's doing nothing. He doesn't even answer my emails. And, uh, and and that is that is frightening. They are aware of banks discriminating. Why don't they do anything about it? I had a just for matter of interest that uh, Julius Malema said the other day, last week at some other conference, that he wants everybody, every black person in South Africa, to live a better life. And I put on social media what he said. But they are aware of discrimination. And to get people, black people, a better life, you've got to get rid of discrimination in this country. And, uh, and Floyd Savimbi actually contacted me, and I, I had a, a Zoom meeting with him on Friday. And I, produ- I, I presented him with all the necessary documentation. Mm. And it seems like they're going to start following up on this. But then we, we, we again have to see this because the, <clears throat> the, the financial houses is sponsoring the political parties. And that is why you don't find that they will very uh, take the matter through. They probably will say, yes, they're going to do it, but it never happens. Yeah, you, what do they say? The don't, don't, don't slap the hand that feeds you, so to say. Absolutely. Yeah. Got you. We're going to join, um, we're going to get uh, Black Business Council CEO Hanki Matabane into this conversation now on Rope MM. Hanki, thank you so much for joining us on Power Lunch. First of all, a very good afternoon to you. Uh, afternoon uh, to you and the listeners. Thank you. And, and also to the panelists. Yeah, we, we, you know, uh, even with the Black Business Council, during your your um, your annual summit, it was a big theme around how black businesses need to start demanding more for themselves, about how the financial services sector needs to come to the forefront and be able to get these banks, uh, you know, and, and, and get themselves investment. But what are we finding in terms of the realities that black business owners face when it comes to getting capital from financial institutions? Do they open them with, do they welcome them with open arms is it still a very as Emerald was saying earlier that there's still much of a risk consideration to account yeah, the, 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 the biggest challenge is that the, the people who are in who are chairing the, the risk committees uh, and, and, and investment committees of, of banks uh, don't necessarily understand the, 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 the market the, the, most of them have never been in a township for five minutes. Uh, they've never been in a rural area. They've never been in an informal settlement. They, they, they're basically reading everything uh, uh, in the newspapers or in, in books. Uh, so when they, they develop their credit policies, 
uh, the credit policies are, are, are discrimin discriminatory in nature. So, for example, if you, if you've got a post box in in Santin, you 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 are favorably considered, mm. uh, even, if, even, even if you don't stay there. Uh, so it's, it's because the, 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 the credit people think uh, where you stay means you, you are able to afford. So they, they, are, they are discriminating against it. And I think hence in the summit we were more focusing on, we need to establish a, 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 a black bank, a, a, and a black bank that is run by black people that, that is owned by black people uh, because the, the, the owners will give direction and the people who are running day to day will, will then understand the, 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 the customers yeah uh, because at the moment the, the the ones who are there don't necessarily understand the customers and what uh, color and, are they though Hanky? the ones that are there that are supposed to assist the risk that are supposed to assist the business especially for these township businesses the guys that sit on the table and make the decisions what's their color yeah, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the color has not changed much. Mm. Uh, we, we have the same color as pre-1994. Uh, you have seen even uh, in the employment equity report, more than 70% of the uh, JSE listed companies are still run by white males. So, so nothing much has changed. Uh, 27 years into democracy, then nothing much has changed. So, so we, we, we really need to move uh, to to the next level of, of actually owning, because when you own, you are able to control. And and when it comes to, you know, the response, so you're saying that a lot of the banks mitigate against uh, risk and the risk as aspect, especially in connection with some of these businesses, these township businesses that they'd have never even been to, they'll never go to, they're white men that sit on the table and make a decision about you know, the business. But they're also white men that sit on the table when Nakhanki and decide, you know what, it's probably better to finance Mark because Mark is based in Santon and we know Mark's brother as opposed to Tepo, whose Tepo does not have a legacy of wealth. How much of an impact does this legacy of wealth, especially when it comes to family and family um, uh, connections, play in being able to even get capital investments from financial institutions? It does. I, I think, hence, we, we were saying... Uh, we also need to get a, a critical mass of black people in 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 these institutions okay? because uh, for example if you put like 10 black people at the top uh, you may find that maybe five are, are, are transformational because sometimes you may find that other people are not transformational they are there for for, for themselves uh, but if we have more we'll get people who are, who are transformational who are at the top who will then be able to understand that the uh, things have to change uh, you don't you don't get into the system and get swallowed by the system. You, are, you you get into the system so that you can change the system uh, and make the system much much better to to to, to support the majority. So so it's, it's important that we we, we get as many uh, uh, as possible black people, uh, women, black women, uh, young people, people with disabilities, because that is the diversity that we need, uh, so that you can be able to understand the customer base. Uh, uh, in totality, rather than mm. only understanding uh, uh, Pete or or Pat or Sam, because his father was the was a director there, or his father was the previous CEO. Uh, 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 so 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 he he he's got the social capital, because social capital is very important. Uh, if you got social capital, you are able to uh, instead of filling the forms at, at reception, you are able to call the CEO and say. Uh, my son is called this business. Please look at uh, look at it. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and and then people then the people who are reporting to the CEO will run around and making sure that the, that business plan works. But if it's a uh, it's a mantra from from uh, Tuluvenu or whatever, it becomes very difficult because Manda doesn't have that social capital. Yeah, Frank, I hear you. And Manda, the thing is, Manda is the first one of his family to get out of poverty. That is the black child story across the board in this country. Black people don't have the uncle or the aunt, hardly any. That is the, the rich uncle and the aunt that can sign surety or the mother and the father that can... <sighs> Guys, we've got a long way to go. Let's go to Kajiso. Hi, Ntlaganipo. Ntlaganipo and Kajiso, hi. Okay, let's go to Centurion. Hi, Zakele. Hey, Faith, how are you? I'm very well, thanks to you, Papa. Go ahead. I'm good. Uh, Faith, we will never win this thing. 
the only way to win this thing is when the government is ready to reinvest on the policies. The policies that we we get post-1994 were not our policies. Were not policies drafted at the best interest of a black child. We were hungry for power. We were given power to go and sit off policies that are governing how to rule in that power. So the main thing that is needed is to sit down, scrutinize those policies, where those policies are really meant to advance everybody living in this country, especially the backward disadvantages in the past. Until we do that, we will mm-hmm. cry foul every day. We need to go and talk to all these documents. People will be talking about NCR, national regulations, MMPCA. Those documents are not our documents. Mm. We have five documents there. We need to talk to those documents first before we can say we are in freedom, before we can say we are ruling this country as black people. I then we'll you. be talking to change the, the life of our black people in this land. I hear you. I hear you, Zakel and Centurion. Thank you very much for that comment. Let's go to Cosmos City. Hi, Vusile. Hi, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, I agree 100% with uh, the previous caller. And yet again, we have to look at the serious fact that if we keep looking at the government for help, we will keep looking at the government. They haven't helped our fathers who helped them fight for this freedom that we we, we are currently enjoying, and yet we still look at them for help. In honest truth, if we really want to change things, we need to take drastic steps. And I mean, the youth be really involved in making sure that legislation, A, everything that is passed from local level has to pass by the people Mm, mm. you get you get what i mean it Mm. has to be agreed to from the people going upwards and again the only way to do that is to leave them out of the equation now and start thinking of our own steps on the other side i have seen a couple of groups of um, young businessmen who have gone into uh starting stocks stock fells say for instance uh there's five who own tax shops yeah so they stock fell and then they go and buy stock using uh, that stock fell money and they are able to negotiate prices because they buy in bulk. Those type of uh, small changes within the way we do, uh, you know, our business and the way we spend our money can actually help us go a long way into challenging stuff like the need for capital and the need for for loans they themselves could at a point start a a financial service uh business and then start handing out loans who knows and probably at a a better rate than anyone else because they would not necessarily need the loan money to kind of you know uh, break even or even make a profit gotcha. so it's 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 those type of thought processes that we need to go into as young people most especially that i think will help us move forward got you uh, emerald you know as we're listening again to to what our power family is contributing to this conversation where do well, black women sit now in this convo I, it's one thing to speak about black people but women in this where are they Oh, hell, I won't be able to answer that question. <laughs> so when it comes to, for example, access to housing, finance, and when it comes to the interest rates being charged on women, is there even a further discrepancy between black men and black women? I, I really don't think so. I don't think so. I think, I think women and men, black people, are, are treated the same from the data that I've, I've got. It's um, just based on color purely. Is based on color. That's all. And what must be done then, Emerald, to change the policies? I mean, we're speaking here, and you're saying that the policies are pre-1994 policies. To be quite frank, they are apartheid-era policies, which means that they were never designed for a black person to succeed in the first place. That's not the yeah. purpose of it, right? They don't exist to benefit black people. If the policies that govern financial institutions are still apartheid-era policies, what do we as people do to to um, to push for amendment, what do we black people do to push for a change in the system? Well, there's one option that is open, and I just want to put it right on the cards that I am not involved in this, um, and that is that I had discussion with community leaders, and if this don't improve or or, or, or discrimination is taken off the cards there can be a massive stop payment action by black people that will literally bankrupt this country. Mm. And this, this has been talking, and I have informed um, the president of, of this as well. 
But once again, I am not involved in this. It's purely the community leaders. But that is on the cards. It's a very interesting time. Hanky, we're listening to Emerald. I mean, Emerald has been a financial investigation consultant for years now. And if the reality is exists like this, um, and, and the financial services systems are prejudiced towards people of color, right, or black people specifically, then surely we need to find a way of taking ownership back. Okay, apart from getting a, 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 a black-owned um, bank, what else can we do? To, to, to really t- respond to the system and respond painfully so. Yeah, we, we, we need to adopt a, a, almost a parallel process. Uh, while we're, we're trying to get a, a, a black bank on one side, uh, when we, we, we find a situation where the policies are, are like that, we need to change them uh, because <laughs> the, the structure of the economy is, is, is such in such a way that the all the sectors are owned by two or three or four players mm. and and those ones they own like 90 to 95 percent so even if we start a, a bank now it will start by by competing for the five percent and the, before it gets into the bigger market so it's important that we we, we work very closely with the competition commission to reduce the the, 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 the market concentration uh, from from 95 percent to maybe 60 percent, uh, so that at least all of us can then be able to compete for the 40 percent that is there. Uh, uh, so so it's, it's important that we 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 when we see a policy that is not up to date, uh, bring it to us. We'll, we'll raise it with the policy makers and and let's change it. Uh, because when you are a lawyer sitting somewhere, you you implementing the policies and the the laws that are there. So so any law that is up, outdated. A, a legal people are, all, are, go, are going to implement it. Uh, so, so let's change those laws uh, so that they are favorable to, 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 the, to the majority of the people. Hmm. Well, when we're going to uh, give our, our guests an opportunity to respond and also to wrap up the conversation with us after 2 o'clock. So they're going to be here to wrap it up uh, for us and we're going to still take in more of your calls because I do see many of you wanting to make a comment on this. Mo Africa saying without land in this country or nothing, period. And what pains me and killing me is the core that black people are the majority in this country. Banks in South Africa got too much power over Treasury as well as the South African Reserve Bank. Um, uh, the, uh, it's not about playing victim. I honestly am tired of being in a country that still doesn't want to be real about the challenges and the deep inequality that's rooted in everything that double standards as well. Amend the law and force e- equality. I, I get you. Amend the law and force equality. Um, somebody saying that they're interested in actually developing their own bank. Maybe we need to find out how to do this. It's not only banks, but the entire system. Insurance companies will classify a particular area as high risk, therefore higher premium. Yet a Santon, in my professional opinion, is a higher risk than Alex. Keep them coming. We're going to take in more of your calls and we're going to get to the bottom of how do we as a people stand up against what would be a system that is trying to keep us in survival instead of significance. Power Lunch with Faith Mangope. Weekdays 12 to 3 p.m. on Power 98.7. Lines are open. 0861987000 as we wrap up this conversation around uh, racial profiling when it comes to the financial services sector. What to do about uh, the amendments to laws? What to do about the policies that, by the way, let me give you a heads up. Policies in the banking sector are still apartheid era policies. So if they're still apartheid era policies, they were never meant to benefit a black person in the first place. So why are we surprised that we get to get access to a home, uh, uh, a car finance instead of access to a home loan? Why does it surprise us if the policies were never designed for us in the first place? But what are we to do as a people? Well, Imra Fanzel, the financial investigation consultant, still joins us for this conversation as well as Hanki Mataban. And furthermore to that, black owners of businesses... You, you find more access to a credit card than you do to capital and investment in your business. And why is that continuously being the narrative that is being perpetuated? You know, Emerald, you're speaking and saying that, you know, I wish President Sir Ramaphosa would answer his, his, his phone or at least answer my emails when it comes to this because they know what the problem is. But uh, it must seem like there is not a lot of uh, political will to amend these existing, uh, these existing apartheid-era policies. And the only way you're saying to bring the, the government 
government to its knees or even to bring these institutions to its knees is by people just stopping altogether. But doesn't, isn't there a regulatory board? I mean, aren't banks regulated by some, you know, by the... Who regulates the banks? Maybe let's start there. Who regulates these banks? Emerald? Okay, we seem to be losing. As I said, it is all around signal. We're going to try to get the clearest signal there from Emerald Fund Sale Financial Investigation Consultant. But really, who, who's in charge of regulating these guys? You know, how do they get them regulated? Hanky, maybe you can add into this. Banks, if the banks are the problem, who regulates the banks? <coughs> yeah, the, 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 the banks are regulated by Reserve Bank. Uh, but that, I think back to my issue, the... It is good now that we are talking about this because that uh, brings a, 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 a it, it brings knowledge to the people and, and uh, what then needs to happen after this is is to look at those uh, legislation. So if if the Reserve Bank is regulating the banks, it's regulating them according to the the regulations that that are there. Uh, but if those regulations are not favorable to to to, to black people. Uh, we we have to change them because if we don't change them, uh, they, they'll they'll still be used. They, they, so the so the the end users, when they they realize that this there are legislations that are, are are being used against them, they 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 have to to to, to make the policy makers uh, aware uh, so that those legislation legislative changes can be sponsored into parliament mm. and, and and ultimately. Uh, cabinet so that the, the, the laws can be changed. Uh, yeah, but then we need to push though, Hangangir. We need to push more than yeah. we're pushing before. I mean, Emerald was speaking earlier that if all black people just stop banking for just even for, probably even for one day, I think all the banks will be brought to their knees, right? If just black people one day decided actually, you cannot continuously have policies that favor uh, a minority, policies of apartheid era operating in financial services institutions. You can't have a reserve bank that is not even pushing forward with, with, with you know, regulating and, and even getting some of these policies right. If we just for one day, Hanky, I'm sure you can appreciate that there'll be a lot of screaming and crying and oh, maybe we need to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I think that 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 can work as a short-term measure. But yeah. uh, if if those laws are are, are not changed, uh, you you stop today and then tomorrow you, you go back again. Uh, you 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 have not necessarily solved the the problem for 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 for, for, for it, 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 and as far as the long term uh, is concerned. So we 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 need to be long term in thinking. Uh, mm. So so. I think if, if there are people who've got those uh, policies and acts that they, they, they know that are, are outdated, uh, let them make, make us aware and we, we will take the issue with the, with the policy makers. Because that, that way will be solving the problem for, for, for our kids. Uh, because otherwise our kids will be fighting the same battle that we're supposed to be fighting ourselves. Uh, and, and they'll spit on our graves that we, we have not done our, our job. Yeah, well, 27 years into this democracy, Hanky, and the good thing is that I'm not speaking to a politician, I'm speaking to a businessman, but 27 years into our democracy, it doesn't exactly um, inspire a vote of confidence that in 27 years we couldn't realize, or maybe we did, and we just, you know, decided to ignore it, we realized that financial, just banking, services sector was favored towards white people, and we needed to change it. It just, you know... Yeah, Hanky, I, I hear you. I'm going to take it to the phone lines. But it makes me wonder, what have we been doing for the past 27 years? What have we been doing for the past 27 years? When you become a leader for the past 27 years, what were you doing? What have you been doing? Moses and Alex. Hi, Moses. Thank you so much for holding. Hi, how is this, sweet? I'm very well. Thanks to you, Papa. Go ahead. Good, good. Uh, you know, the, 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 the solution for this problem that we are having now is very simple. The, the only thing that we need to do is that, just that uh, these banks, they don't have a competition that, that, that favors uh, black people. That's why they can manipulate prices and what they, whatever the interest that, 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 that they put against the, 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 the black person. Mm-hmm. So the only thing that we need to do as black, black South African or, or as blacks as a whole, we need to open our own banks. And then you will see now when the... the, the even them, they will come to 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 to, to our, uh, I mean our ground, yeah. whereby they they, they they will have to to comply with whatever needs that uh, uh, can benefit the the, the blacks. But now because of, they don't have co- uh, competition, 
And, and then even though when we opened the bank, we, we wasn't open only one bank. It must be uh, banks that, 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 that are owned and, yeah. and, and, and beneficial to, 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 to the blacks. And when I'm also, so, I'm going to take it a step further. And when we yeah. open our own banks, yo, please, can we not have allegations of looting and stealing money from our elderly people and stealing money, the pension fund, because when we want to make ourselves rich. Me, I'm tired of the narrative that when black people open up something, there must always be thievery or thuggery associated. When we're opening up these banks. That, that's true. The family of the banks. So I want to ever ever the banks about to run. You know, and over still out of a look competition or like people well, will have a, will have a a, a choice a, a, until any point of choice or okay, I'll I'll prefer to bank with this one and then like mm-hmm. when there is a competition, there is a there is a there is a low risk or yeah to 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 have those uh, kind of. Uh, stories whereby uh, people that they just yeah. benefiting themselves out of out of out of it. But if it's, it's just gonna be one bank, one bank, I'm afraid like it's also gonna be um, it can be mm-hmm. manipulated by the, the by the the, the the big banks that that are already there. I hear you, Moses. I gotta run so many calls to take, but I, I get you completely. Marakup, you can we please open up our own black banks? And then when we do, ne, kupariska uza chelete angkon. Oh, but tung chelete yang kono kupariska uza di chelete tang kono, because then that in itself just further curses us as black people. We're cursing ourselves by stealing from even the elderly. Tali in in Fairy Glen, hi. Ruita chelete zaba kono. Kupariska uza di chelete zabo kono. You zabo kono. Unkono o investi le money inside of your bank because when you're a black bank and then chigi chigi when are you gonna pocket the money? You're gonna be in the news. Both faith have to speak about you on the radio because uza chelete zabo kono. That's true. Let me not waste your time and give other listeners an opportunity. I'm a bond originator and I just wanna say it from my side. Yeah. While we can't deny that there's racism in our country and actually the whole world, mm. and black people are not favored. And that it's true that for insurance purposes, your residential address is used to de- determine your risk. Uh, that should be amended, because now if you are staying in a township, you are going to pay more insurance than your colleague that's renting, you know, in the, in the suburbs. Gotcha. But, but to get approval for any loan, I work with home loans, yes, but ma'am. I think it applies to any other loan. Your physical address or who you are connected to, it plays no part in you being approved. I've actually helped people that were from squatter camps. Mm-hmm. I've gone into people's checks, helped them apply for a home loan to buy houses in upmarket places. Mm-hmm. And they got approved at good rates. And actually people that are staying in those areas, because they're not defaulting on their accounts, and they, they may have one or two accounts, uh, they they not they, some of them don't even have credit cards. Their their risk profile is damn good. So you finding that those people are getting approvals. So and most of those people are saving are, are saving money. Mm. So now I would say as much as we don't have black banks now, let's work at getting your credit reports right. Uh, your job stability affects if you are not permanently employed. You are on contract. You are going to be declined by other banks, not mm, because mm. of your skin tone. We are assisting both black and white. I'm an originator. We work with both white and black clients. So it all depends on your credit profile, how you are conducting it. You say if you have to open a bank now, like uh, 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 the, the lady that just started now, yeah. you are not going to borrow. If I have to come to you and look for, for, for financing from you, and you know I have not paid... 10 other people, live on Matronita. are you going to give me money? You are not going to loan me because I'm high risk. As people are not paid. So all I'm saying is, and also the issue of Sambo, it's very safe. It needs to be sorted if it's not sorted now. Um, I know I work with some of these people that have bought houses in the early 90s. Mm. So uh, the F&B bought that book. So if you buy, if you're a business person and you're buying another company, you're buying it with contracts as it is. It may look lucrative because the interest rates are high. You're going to make money. So it's not the fault of F&B. Those people were getting high interest rates from there. So I just think, uh, I think it's, it's, it's time. This issue of Sambo is, is, is over. It's exhausted. If it's not sorted, it just needs to be sorted. And, and F&B needs to make a public 
uh, uh, you know, media and, and uh, presentation to tell us how they are sorting the ethics. Because now we are going to be drawn into emotional debates about banks are racist and all that when it's not the case. You don't you think know? that you don't think that banks are also uh, prejudiced? Uh, so interest rates, no. I think there's racism everywhere. I suffer racism in the business world also. But I, when it comes to interest rates, I'm a bond originator. I do home loans for black, both black and white people. Yeah. So uh, this criteria is used for everyone. I and know. when you apply for a home loan or any other loan, they don't say, oh, because you are staying in deep slot or because you are staying in Alex, we are going to give you a high interest rate. No, they check in your bank account conduct your job stability. And what happens is now I have formed uh, a partnership with mm. other people. We are going to be working with subcontractors because I noticed that with SMEs, they also come and say, you know, I applied and I'm being declined. Yeah. Banks don't want to give black I hear you, Tali. I got I to gotta run, Tali, but I, I completely it's hear you. True. Yeah, I hear you completely. Um, I don't know if people agree with you. I don't know what other people's experiences are, but uh, it's an interesting one that you're bringing to the table. D said so hi in West Rand. Hi. Hi, Mama. I, I, just wa- I just wanted to say I concur with the biggest caller, but I also disagree as well. I also feel that also as, as, as black people, we also need to spend a lot of time trying to understand how the system works mm. before we actually accept the credit. Because people are quick to get excited about owning a property, but not looking at the terms and the conditions of the contract. And then later on, when the excitement is over, they come back and complain and say banks are not you know, are not favorable to black people and, and, and. But I'm not saying that uh, discrimination does not happen. Discrimination happens. But I think as, 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 as South Africans, we've been talking about, you know, discriminations and all of these things that are happening. And I hear one of your callers spoke about um, withholding money from businesses a little bit. And, 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 and I think maybe that is a strategy. But what needs to happen, we actually need to redirect the money. We need to also start supporting our own businesses, yeah. our own businesses even more and we need to have a, a proper conversation about that where we also change change our narratives about how we see other new businesses coming up because what you find is that even us black people we stop going to a certain shop once we realize that it's owned by you know mm. by a black person also. Mm. so that is also a factor so we need to to get to a point where we also as well start interrogating the products that we use the cars that we drive who they come from who they benefit and which economy they benefit I but more you. than anything we need to remember that apartheid was a system and economic inequality is also a system. I love that. Economic inequality is also a system. Yeah, look, look. at the end of the day, we have to be able to look at both sides of the coin, right? And be able to interrogate it. Emerald was saying there's definitely evidence of discrimination. So we're not sucking this, thumb th- th- sucking this. Khanki Mataban is saying there's definitely discrimination. That's why there needs to be a further call for a black bank. What do you say? Wayne Observatory, thank you so much for holding so long. Wayne, hi. And your pleasure, Tracy. Oh, great program. Um, Thank you very much. Very balanced, a lot of aspects. Um, yes, there is the affordability issue. You've got to tick some boxes. Um, I've helped people invest in property in and around Joburg CBD for the last 25 years. There is prejudice, and it's very deep. It's like last year I had two specialist black doctors mm. try to buy a little block of flats in Rosettenville, okay? Mm-hmm. And three of the major banks said no bad area, okay? Now, bad area in the last eight years It'll shock people because they read mainline press. But, but in the last eight years, Rosettenville increased by 80% because people were starting to buy their homes. And Parkhurst went minus five in the last eight years. Do you know how much finance Investec, and I'll name them, okay, did eight years ago in Parkhurst? It was something like $120 million more than double any other bank. Okay? So, so they invested in an area based on what? Based on white faces. Okay, so when they say an area is bad, what do they mean bad? Oh, do you mean it's mostly black people that live there? Because it's full, it's close to town. How can an area like Rosettenville, five minutes from the away from the biggest CBD on the continent, be bad? No, so, so that subtle prejudice. So mm-hmm. then how does a nurse go buy a house for 700000 if she can't afford Phantom? Well, she's got to go to Rosettenville. Well, then she's got to tick more boxes because the bank said bad. Now, how can I have two specialist doctors? In, trust me, they're black as well. So trust me, white specialist doctors probably haven't had a loan decline for 25 years. So all these things are very subtle. And that was, yes, it was a commercial block, but, but it was just the area was bad. I was told by three different banks, okay, yeah. without fundamentals. So, so this is my big bug bear. Your whole talk is, there's two very valid points. There's deep prejudice and it's subtle because tell me all the directors of all the banks, tell me about all their offshore bank accounts. 
And if they've got big offshore bank accounts, they're not prejudiced because they are anti-African. Okay, so so how can they be driving our banks? It's the same. I catch the bus every week, park station. I catch many bus taxis. I, 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 I live a Joburg environment. And when Graham went under, I was shocked that the white oak gets, gets to talk about why Graham went down. And I thought, I've never seen a white guy at park station. Okay, so you, you, and, and I could have told him, Ground, it was they weren't being punctual. Mm. The internet site wasn't working. And he, and he had the audacity to go on radio and tell us, no, 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 there's no upmarket demand. I thought, no, Interpap is eating you because ground is useless. Because Wayne, you're not doing the I got to run. I love what, you, what you're saying, but I got to run. Let's go to Madrand. Uh, Mohaila, hi. Is it Mohaila? Yes, it's Mohaila. Hi, Mohaila. Lovely oh, name, by the way. I, I like that name. Hi, <laughs> Thank go ahead. You. I just uh, think uh, there's a lot of things which are criminal in banking, and one of them is this credit score thing. Mm. You are scored for having debt. So you have a lot of kids coming out of university and they don't have any debt. They get their first job and all this wonderful stuff, pay slips and everything, and they cannot be loaned to because you don't have a credit score. And I'm saying, when is the world going to appreciate people who are debt free? When are we going to start talking about a clean score? Well, they're going to tell you that you're a high risk, thank you. Yeah? If you've got a high a clean score, they're gonna say you're high risk because there's no trace but of how are you high risk when you've been a, when you've just become a chartered accountant, yeah. you work for Deloitte, everything is intact, but you don't have a credit score. I think this is where all of this starts, where people start getting into debt because you're being encouraged to loan stuff. So your cell phone is on account, a whole lot of things which shouldn't be on account mm. start being on account and becomes a really vicious cycle. And I'm saying we need to change the terminology. What is right? What is wrong? What do people want to be? It's free. So why do you say get into debt to be out of debt? It, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. I, I get you, Mahalia. Thank you very much for that. Let's go to Kahiso and Mudran. Hi, Kahiso. How are you, Asfet? How are you? I'm very well. Thanks, Sindhu, Papa. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good, good. I think I, I have to agree with certain callers. Um, and then the lady that just called, say, uh, banks are just, you know, doing an, a generic uh, overview of, credit for everybody else. I think she is not, you know, honest with what she's been saying. I currently uh, am an entrepreneur. I was working for one of the largest mining um, groups Mm -hmm. and I left my job because I wanted to, you know, focus on my career. Currently, my biggest challenge is banks that don't want to approve for any capital injection, for projects, for whatever. You know, I've just been appointed nicely as an SMME. And my biggest struggle is to get a 500,000 loan with FMB for a 3 million contract. And I feel it's so frustrating that, you know, we, we are out here and we're talking these things. But the bottom line is you have a banker that cannot even make decision making inside the bank. So just tell you, no, your application was, was, was declined. On what? You don't know. So I think the system is so corruptive when that, you know, black people are just, you know, put aside and whatever that, you know, the next application that comes forth, it gets approved. But, you know, we don't get concrete uh, information as to what is actually declining the application. I mean, they look at the financials, they request this. But when you go out to get a, you know, a vehicle, mm-hmm. you know, your, your application is so quick to be approved. So I just, I just feel that we need, we, need, we need a serious change and we need to really challenge this. Yeah, and 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 I would be up for any petition of not paying anything from now because clearly this is this is not on. I hear you, Kakiso, and I got you completely. And thank you so much for your contributions to this conversation. I know that our lines are going crazy still, but thank you so, so much. Rainy Makino saying, Hi, Faith. Once we as black people understand the buying power we as black people possess, then we will earn the respect. Without us, there won't be any profits. And I say this in light. And look, I'm going to share something very personal. So um, uh, some time ago, I think it was about... Uh, two years ago. So it's about, yeah, it's about two years ago, a year and a half, two years ago. Um, I was in a process of, of buying a certain property and and the banks themselves, and I remember the, the even the bond originators and, and the like, they were like, oh, that's great. And what I was surprised to note while I was going through this process was that when buying um, one of an apartment of mine, the banks were very quick to respond. Yeah, you got your first apartment. As soon as you start wanting to scale up a little, then you start seeing the real pushback. Then you start seeing the fight to a point where I even got asked where my money is coming from. And I thought to myself, do you ask 
white people where their money is coming from. And then they said, no, we see a lot of transactions in your bank account. And I thought to myself, surely a lot of transactions in my bank account means that you need to look at my savings account because that's where the money is. But I was so surprised at how when you buy an apartment, there's so much clapping that happens. When you rent out, there's so much clapping that happens. But when you want to buy, you know, investment property, when you want to start scaling up as a black person, then the questions come of where does your money come from? And made me wonder, as a black female in this country, were you looking at me like I was a thief or that I'm a money trafficker or that I'm laundering money just by the premise of my skin? And do you ask the same question to Sandra and to Megan and to Kim? Do they get the questions that I do? And one day a friend of mine came up to me, one of my best friends. He said to me, Faith, your problem is you're approaching the financial services sector as a black woman. Mistake number one. Maybe when you start approaching the financial services sector as a white Jewish man, this country will take you seriously. And when I caught that and I took that straight to my banker, the rest is history. But maybe that's what we need to start doing, demanding more for ourselves as black people. You've been listening to a Power 98.7 podcast. For more podcasts, visit power987.co.za or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.